we are going to look at the passage that teaches us or tells us the story of the Magi, what they were looking forward to. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Matthew chapter 2. It's the first book of the New Testament, or you can just find it on your phone or you can Google it. We're going to actually read through it a bit. Um, I'm going to read it, and uh, I'm going to ask us all to stand as I read. I believe that uh, the Word of God, the Bible, is a book. Uh, Back here we have a library. It's filled with books. But it's a book like no other book. Uh, I believe these are words that God would have us know and hear. Words that reveal who God is. Words that reveal much about our world and our life that we need to know. God speaks to us through these words. And so that's why I ask us to stand and to give it some honor. Even though in your heart you may not feel it, wherever you are, um, I just ask you to stand as we read this. And so Matthew chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. And they told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, and the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them the time when the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for this child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed on their own, to their own country, by another way. Please be seated. I want to take a few minutes this morning to kind of look at this story of, of, I was introduced, I think, really well in this video. It kind of gives us a bit of the background, but what was it? Why, Why is it significant that the king of the Jews, as he's called, was born? What does that mean for us today? But to understand that, we need to begin here. And so we're going to crawl through these verses Just the beginning, slowly. Don't be concerned at how slow I'm going through the verses, okay? Don't, I'm not, I'm not setting up a long meeting here. But if you look at uh, Matthew, we'll just start at the beginning of chapter 2 there again. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, as as we were told a little bit about Herod, uh, Herod was king over the area of of Jerusalem. Now, he was a a client king. He wasn't uh, a someone who had come to power and ruled freely over that area as he wished. Uh, He was a client king put in by Rome. And so Rome was the superpower of the time, and they had Herod there because he was willing and capable and able to lead the people there. Um, And and he did. His life is very well documented. If you're really curious about Herod, you can read Josephus. He has a lot written about him. Um, uh, And he did do some uh, amazing things. He built some beautiful buildings and structures, built cities, Caesarea. Um, Of course, you can't build buildings without money. Uh, And so this obviously came at great cost to the people who paid taxes to Herod. And it's true that towards, more towards the end of Herod's life, though maybe he wasn't entirely stable through a lot of his life, but certainly towards the end of his life, he became quite paranoid. Um, Herod had a reputation for brutality. Um, He had... A few of his sons, several, I believe, killed. A few of his wives killed. 
So much so that uh, in Rome, uh, they would say that they would rather be Herod's pig than his son. They were Jews. They didn't eat pigs. And so your life expectancy was going to be much longer if you were a pig, if you were Herod's pig, than if you were Herod's son. Uh, so he, was a, he had a reputation for brutality, and particularly towards the end of his life when he became quite paranoid. He was very concerned. Uh, we're told uh, that uh, no one would mourn his passing because he was such a brutal man. And so he devised a plan that he would round up a whole bunch of uh, prominent Jewish leaders into his stadium and at his death have them all slaughtered because then there would be mourning. This is kind of the, the scale that this man was at. He, he, he was a harsh, hard ruler to be under and a, a man that people feared. Herod, King Herod. Moving on, so in the days of King Herod, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. As the video told us a bit, if you've kind of had this vision that the wise men came from China or India, you might be shooting a bit too far. They were, they were most likely, of course there's no confirmed facts, but uh, they're most likely from Babylon. Uh, and Babylonians would have understood uh, a lot of Jewish history. Uh, they had, uh, as they explained, there was a time when uh, Babylon captured Jerusalem, took some of the brightest and best to, Jerus to Babylon to serve there. The stories of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego all take place during that time. And so they would have had records of Israel's history and, um, and significantly this Messiah that they were looking for. We're going to talk a bit more about that. This king that they were eagerly looking for. Um, it doesn't tell us how many wise men there were, actually. And, and these weren't kings. They were wise men or magi, probably servants. And so that whole we three kings of Orient are, it misses it a bit. It, it, that they weren't, they weren't kings. These are probably servants, if you like, serving under a leader, not a king themselves. And we don't know that there were three. We're just told that they're wise men. They bring gold, frankincense, and myrrh. I think that's how we land on that there were three of them. But those are minor details, right? That's just kind of a bit of church history that's kind of added those information in. But the actual text doesn't tell us how many they were. And to be honest, it probably wouldn't be just three people traveling on three camels, even if, if there were three. Uh, there would have been a caravan, a large caravan. You don't travel through the wilderness with a bunch of gold. <laughs> It's, it's not going to go well for you, right? You're, you're going to bring military support. Uh, you're going to see a king. You're going to bring a bit of an entourage. And so, and, and I, I don't imagine if you're into camping <laughs> that they had any ultralight camping gear in those days. And so there would have been a lot of gear packed in there, food, provisions for a long journey from Babylon across the wilderness. And so it was probably as they arrived in Jerusalem, Picture an entourage parking outside of the gates with setting up their tents, a community of people. This is not something that would have gone unnoticed. Okay. And so continuing on in uh, where we were in, in, in verse 2. And so they come and they say, Where is he who has been born, king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Some people struggle if you, with this. They say, ah, oh, look, oh, come on, a star, a star appeared. Like, uh, we can look at now, I'm, I'm, I've studied science. I can look at astronomical records and say there was no star that suddenly appeared. That doesn't just happen. Just before you throw out the baby with the bathwater here, it, it could have been that there was a miraculous occurrence here where a star appeared and led these people. There are other explanations for what occurred, too. Uh, Halley's Comet passed by. It would have been visual to the naked eye about 11 BC. Comets were omens of good or evil. And this is recorded, oh, OK, so it'll, this is going to nerd. It's going to be a little bit nerdy here. But in the Bayeux Tapestry of 1066, which describes the Battle of the Romans, or the, sorry, the Normans. Yeah, nobody knows what that is. OK. I know what that is. Um, anyhow, even in the, so there is a tapestry from 1066, which describes a great battle in Europe. And it was significant because a comet passed by. They even drew it in the tapestry. 
And the comet was an omen of something good or evil that was about to happen. It was a significant event. And so wise men in Babylon, seeing, who look at the stars, who look at the night sky, remember again, this is, this is a time when there were no street lights. And it's a time, and it's geographically a place closer to the, board, to the equator where nights are long and days are short. Okay, so, so it might be 50-50. Uh, if you travel to the equator, the sun's going to set at 6 and it's going to rise at 6. And so your nights are long. It's not like here in Canada in the summer where our nights are short. And so the night sky was a significant thing. You, it would be a big part of your life. And, and so they see it. They study the stars. They, 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 and so they would observe and see something like a comet. They would also, okay, so it could have been something like that. It also could have been what they call a convergence where you have, you, there are times when you can see Saturn and Jupiter in the sky. There are not normal stars that appear. And when Saturn and Jupiter align close together with the moon in the sign of Aries, I just made that part up. <laughs> but, it, like, but then that would mean something to them. And so all I'm saying is, God could use any means to communicate what this is. When, when we're given this text, uh, it's written in the language of appearances. And, and we're given the, the kind of the basic information. We're not given all the details of how it occurred. And so when you read this about a star, yes, it could have been something totally miraculous that happened, a star appearing. But it could have been any one of these other things as well and still be keeping with the biblical text and keeping with the story. Continuing on. We have these, these the people, these, so the, the, the wise men are coming and say, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? They were looking for a king of the Jews. They, obviously, the star did not tell them. It was not a writing in the sky that said king of the Jews has been born, and they, you know, connected the lines or something like that. But they had a historical record of this one who would come, a significant one, who was called the king of the Jews. And this was a significant figure in Jewish culture. Um, this was someone who was greatly anticipated, eagerly longed for. When uh, I, have a, I work with a, someone who, uh, she even said I work with him. I, I know a friend who is applying to a job and he's very excited about this job. He's very excited about this potential job. And uh, so he, every break we have, he's checking his email to see if he's heard from them. And then in between a bit, he's pulling out his phone every now and then checking to see if he's got a message from them. And often in his conversation, his mind will reflect to, oh, if, if I get this job, then this. And it's about how life's going to be better. If I get this job, then I, I'm going to have more money to do these kinds of things. If I get this job, it'll offer me these kinds of freedoms. If I get this job, it'll offer me this kind of upward mobility. And he thinks about it all the time. It's never far from the front of his mind. Because it fills him with such hope. He's so eager for it. The Jews... The Jewish people lived this way, looking for this one who would come. He'd be the one who would save them, who would restore them, who would be their king, who would bring justice and peace to where they lived. As explained a little bit in the video, the, the, the Jewish people, the nation of Israel, were God's chosen people. We've talked about, I've talked about this before. Very significantly, God, their history was wrapped in God doing wonderful and amazing things for them. They were formed by God miraculously bringing them out of slavery in Egypt. And you can read about that in the Bible, or you can watch the Disney movie about Moses or something like that. And, and it... And, and, and so they were formed and they became his people. God revealed himself to them. He gave them a law. And he said, and it was describing who he was and, and who they were. And he was saying, this is how you're going to live. And it's different than all the other nations because you're going to be my people. And he led them 
through the wilderness. And he led them into the promised land. And he, and he said, I will be your God. I will be for you. I will be with you. I am real. I'm active. I'm powerful. And you will be my people. You will be my representatives to the world. Just walk with me. Obey me and I will bless you. And the story of the nation of Israel is that they didn't. And, and God called them time and again through the prophets. Return to me. Your first love. I loved you dearly. You're my people. God knew that as they went and worshipped these other gods, it would lead to being ensnared in sin, being kept from him. It would lead to lives of brokenness and hurt. And he called and he called and they would not listen. And God said, look, you mean so much to me that I'm not going to let you go. But I'm going to call you to me in the most dramatic way possible. Sure enough, armies came and destroyed the city. The very city, the very place, and I've talked about this before too, they built a temple to God. It was the dwelling place of God where the supernatural met the natural. They would, it was the place, they said, that God dwelt in a special way like nowhere else. And it was when they dedicated the temple, it, dramatically God came and filled the temple. It, it was, and when these armies came, they just destroyed it. It was gone. And they were taken into exile or killed. And, they, and God continued, though, to call his people and told them one day someone will come. He'll be your king. He'll be your eternal king. And he'll be good and just and right. And he'll restore you as a nation. And so the nation of Israel yearned for that king. If you know the story, a little bit later, 70 years after they've been in captivity, they do come out and they return to Israel. They begin to rebuild Jerusalem, the city. They rebuild the temple. But it's not like it was before. They rebuilt the building, but there, there was no dramatic movement of God to fill the temple. They were happy to build it. It said the young people cheered and the old people wept. They were back in Jerusalem, but God was not among them. God was not with them. So they continued to yearn for this king who would make everything right, who would restore them to God. So this was the king of the Jews that the people yearned so eagerly for and looked for. And so this entourage pulls up outside Jerusalem. Would have been talked about by everyone. Would have been on the news, tweets if they had it. All kinds of stuff, the, the gossip at the market. And they come and they say, where is this king of the Jews that's been born? And of course... That gets everybody stirred up. He's come. There would have been people saying, I doubt it. There would have been people saying, I'm excited for it. Some are, many would have been saying, oh, I hope, it's, I hope it's him. And of course, Herod, this is towards the end of his life, in his paranoid state, felt very threatened. And he would. And this is the king of the Jews. Uh, Herod has a plan for his continuation. One of his children who survives is going to take over. He himself is threatened by this king. So he had to get rid of him. Matthew includes this in the text for another significant reason. This was, and this is an important thing, it was... These wise men coming were not Jewish themselves. They were what, we, what the Bible would call Gentiles. We are also Gentiles. I think most of us are Gentiles. And these Gentiles are coming to worship the king of the Jews. Matthew, who is writing this text after, if you read through, after Jesus Christ has returned and risen, the church has become to be established 
in the historical record, you can read it in Acts, you would have seen that Jesus was not only the king of the Jews, but he was king of the world, of all nations. That Gentiles and Jews together were coming to worship and to know Christ. And so Matthew includes this as a very early indicator that this was always God's plan, that Gentiles would come to worship this king. And, you know, I think part of us, especially in Canada, we don't have a king. Uh, Okay, I guess we do, technically, right? (laughs) The idea of a king doesn't capture us. Uh, we, we, We live in a democracy, really, and we understand kings and queens are really just figureheads. They're on our money, but they don't really mean much to us. Um, They are celebrities at best that you kind of follow on the news or something like that, catch up on the gossip. But they don't form any um, great, meaningful, don't have any great, meaningful, significant impact on our world or our lives day to day. But it hasn't always been that way. And so to understand the concept of king, we kind of have to remove ourselves from our modern perspective and kind of see it from an ancient perspective. See, if, if you can, just for argument's sake, imagine the medieval period. None of you remember that time. It was a long time ago. But imagine yourself there in the medieval period, and uh, you're a, a, a farmer. You're trying to make ends meet by farming to feed your family. Um, the, there's many factors that work against you, even as farmers have today. You've got, you got weather that could be work against you. You could have bad crops. You could, all, all kinds of different things that could happen with environmentally that could make it life difficult. But another difficult thing is that if four guys get horses and some swords, uh, they could come and say, you know what, give us all your crops because we're more powerful than you. And that's completely not just. That's unfair that they wouldn't do any of the work but then take all the, all the crops, all your, all, your, all your food that you need to feed your family and you could sell to make money. And so it creates this great insecurity. And so what's needed is a king, someone who creates a a place where there is peace, where there is security, someone who could fight your battles for you and defend you. And so if you move your your farm, maybe close to where the king's castle is and his city or whatever, you would be protected by that king. Now, I know I'm speaking ideally. I'm not saying every king in history was so noble and good. But this is the way it would, should be, right? And you have this king who has rules, who has structure, and who has a military to back up those rules so that now you could farm in peace and security and that you would be able to live a fruitful life providing for your family. It's what you want. So the concept of a king, when you think of the concept of a king, don't think of our modern kings and queens. Think back in an ancient mindset. It would be someone who provides protection, who brings justice, who brings peace, so that you can flourish, so that you can live. But the king of the Jews was going to do something even more significant. And I'll read this to you. If you want, you can turn to Hebrews chapter 8. He would create this new relationship. And this was key for the Jewish people. This was what they were yearning for as well. In verse 10 of of Hebrews 8, this is a quote from Jeremiah the prophet in the Old Testament. He says this, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. This is the relationship. This is the promise. The relationship that I'm going to establish with these people. So this is Jeremiah speaking of a future date. He says, after those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws into their minds. I'll write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. And they should not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother saying, know the Lord. For they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest. For I will be merciful towards their iniquities and I'll remember their sin no more. This king of the Jews wasn't just going to come and establish security, peace, and prosperity. But he was going to restore relationship with the God who created all things. With the God who ruled over all things. He said, they will be my people. They will know me. And and not know about. 
Okay, he's not talking about that kind of a knowledge. He's saying, you'll know me. You'll be in a relationship with me. We will know each other. And so this king was going to come and restore a relationship with the God who rules over all things. And in this knowing, there would be, it was, it was birthed out of love. It was, it, can you imagine, can you imagine somebody knowing you completely? And I'll bet you there's nobody in your life who knows you completely, knows everything about you. You'll have people that are very close to you, loved ones, spouses, close friends, who know a lot about you, but very rarely will we reveal everything about us because we're so ashamed and afraid that we would be rejected, and we even say maybe rightfully rejected. But this God will know you, love you, Know the real you and love you. Do you understand what that does to a person? There are people who will spend their life either seeking love or living their life in brokenness because they're not loved. Being known and loved brings real security. It brings strength. It brings fortitude. This relationship with God brings great value. Sometimes we feel important because we're known by important people. Or maybe we feel important because we're known by lots of people. Can you imagine being known by the God of the universe and loved by him? Oh, it brings importance to a life. It brings value to a life. And then he, you get to be, we would, they would be his people. It brings purpose to a life. You can't live a fruitful life without security, love, purpose, meaning, you will spend your life looking for those things. Or as I said, spend a broken life trying to medicate yourself because you don't have those things. Those are, and this is not, I'm not speaking, this is, psychology says this. We know this. You know it in yourself. This king of the Jews has come. What they've been looking forward to this restored relationship, this hope, this peace, he's come. He's come. As he goes on to say in the passage, I'll skip down to verse uh, 5. They told him, as, as he's looking for, uh, sorry, the, 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 Herod's trying to discern where will this king be born, and the, the scribes look, and they say, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it's written by the prophet. This is, they're quoting the, the, the prophet Micah. You can read his letter. It's in the Bible. And he says, and you, O Bethlehem, and the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Matthew is demonstrating here, by having them quote Micah, that Jesus was the fulfillment of everything that they had longed for. And that this king was Christ. And that this exile that they were experiencing this separation from God, this restoration would come through this one, Jesus Christ. And as we look back on history now, we know the life of Christ. We can see the life he lived. We can hear the things he said. We can read about them in the Bible. And we know that he died. We know that he rose again. And we know that he's ruling even now. And all of God's promises, the hope that he gives, comes to us through Christ. And so in preparation, in closing, in preparation for this Christmas season, I want to speak to three different peoples, groups of people. 
One, maybe you have no relationship with Jesus Christ at all. Maybe you're completely indifferent to him, don't really know much about him. I would implore you to consider what the scriptures have to say. In this season of Christmas, take the time to read and to ask questions. You can ask any question you want. You can have doubts. It's, it's fine. Ask questions. Find another Christian who's willing to walk with you through just a reading of, of any one of these, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. And ask questions. Ask hard questions. Because if this is true, this has significant impact on your life. Eternal and even for today. Examine history. History tells us this is true. Examine the scriptures. You can read them and examine your heart. Look inward too and say, am I really satisfied? Because you can chase after a million things thinking you're going to find security in your wealth, in your, in your position at work, or in your relationships. Those things can disappear in a moment. Consider the claims of Christ and who he is. Another group of people that I would speak to in this season of preparation for Christmas. And I'm going to, the last two are kind of close. Religious people. If you come to church because you ought to, and maybe you give money to the church because you ought to, and Maybe you even read your Bible because it's good to do, and you live a moral and decent life because maybe somehow you believe there is a God and you don't want to upset him. Maybe you want to get his blessings, or maybe you want to uh, live forever, and so you're going to take this little bit, and I'll do my little bit, and that'll be the exchange. I give up my Sunday mornings, and then I live forever, and bad things don't happen to me. You're so close but there's so much more. There's so much more to know. It's like having a gift and having it there wrapped and saying, what a nice gift, and never opening it to enjoy it. And so in this Advent season, this time of preparation, I would encourage you to Dig deeply into who Christ is. Dig deeply into what he's done and really seek to know him because it will transform your life. It'll change you. And it's never too late. Now, I would also speak to those who are followers of Christ. You who have heard about Jesus and your life has changed. You live your life differently because you don't see yourself as king of your life, but rather that there is a king. And maybe you read your Bible, you worship him. I would encourage you in this season of preparation to take time daily, because I know life can be busy. And don't let that relationship grow stale. Seek to know him more. Worship him. Enjoy him. Fellowship with him. Walk with him. Invite him into your days. Look for him throughout your days. We have been given a gift that is beyond compare. And so I encourage everyone, seek to open that gift, to really discover it. Seek to know him and be transformed by him. And I pray that your response would be like the wise men who come to worship. And until that time, I pray that you would be like Herod and agitated until you know him. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful for your goodness and for your love. God, what a wonder that you would come to us, to make yourself known. I know for myself, and I believe I would speak for everyone in this room, that if my thoughts 
were ever recorded and projected on the screen, I would book it out of here and never come back. God, I'm, I'm, I know of, of my selfishness. I know of my anger. I know of my, um, of my sin. And, and God, yet you come and you seek us out. And you delight in us. And you love us. God, I pray that in this season that you would help us to take in a little bit more of the breadth and depth of your great love and that we would be transformed. God, that you would be glorified. And Lord, that we could know true life. In Jesus' name, amen.